Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Rafey. Uh, I appreciate you joining my webinar, whether you're watching live with the 85 of us in here. Thank you so, so much for spending your cloudy Thursday morning with me, or if you're watching this later on YouTube. Uh, for those of you who are live, please head over to my YouTube channel. You will see a ton of videos, a ton meaning seven or so, uh, which are webinars just like this one. If you haven't seen them, please watch them. Uh, I'll actually mention a few of them here today, but we're hoping to build a, a good database for everybody to be able to look at kind of things that we think will help you win your cases and ultimately put more money in your pocket and your client's pocket. Today, I'm going to talk about taking an expert deposition. By far, by far to me at least, taking an expert deposition is one of the scariest things that you do as a lawyer because it's one of the few times at least that you are not the smartest person in the room about that topic. Now, y'all have heard the, uh, seen the commercials, heard the saying of, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I did stay at a, a stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. That's how I feel when I take expert depositions, because a lot of times I know the subject matter better than the expert, especially police officers. I will know the facts of the case. By this point, I, I know all the police officer training and I know uh, all the accident reconstruction uh, benchmarks. And I mean, I, I know all that stuff. But no matter what, I didn't go through the true training. And that police officer really is an expert. I'm just the guy who stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night. Same with doctors. You know, by this point, if you do what I do, I think I could be an orthopedic surgeon. Um, but again, I'm just the guy who stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night. So what I want to run through with you today is how I go about preparing for and then taking a deposition. We won't spend too, too much time on the preparation part, but I think it's important to touch on a few things. But before we get there, let's start with the most basic question that there is. Who is an expert? Who is an expert? And my answer to you is that an expert is anyone with specialized training that will help the jury understand something. Anybody with specialized training or skill that will help the jury understand and presumably find in your favor. The reason that, that this is my definition of experts is because I think it's broader. It's broader than what a lot of people traditionally think as the range of experts. Typically, you think of experts as being people you hire, or people that are treating your client, meaning doctors and, and surgeons and uh, physical therapists, all those folks. I think it's broader than that. I think it's broader than that. You have to remember that almost everybody who has a job out there is an expert in that job, unless you know, they shouldn't have that job. My paralegals are experts at being a paralegal. We have a lawyer in our office. He is the expert at the federal rules. I mean, that, that is his thing. Whatever your expertise is, almost everybody has one in the world. So I think the first step when you're looking at the witnesses in your case and who you think can prove your points, the first step is figuring out, can I make any of these people experts? So police officers, paramedics, first responders, uh, nurses, firefighters, whoever's involved in your case, Think of them as experts in their job. And if you do that, you might find that you have more experts in your case than you even realize. Here's the best thing about experts that are naturally involved in your case, meaning that they are fact witnesses in your case because they know facts about whatever happened, but also expertise by the nature of their job and their skill and their experience. The best thing about these people is they're free. They're free. You don't have to go and hire them. You may have to pay for a deposition, but you don't have to go hire them. You don't have to go find them. You don't have to do all the rule disclosures, at least in the state court of Georgia, you don't. But you have access to them. You have access to police officers because you can go hunt them down. Here's my tip. The best way to find a police officer is find out when shift changes and then go at the end or the beginning of, si of shift change and go and meet that officer. That is the absolute best way to get to a police officer. Doctors, they'll meet with you. Now you may have to send a check for that meeting, but their time is valuable. And that's so much better than having to go pay some expert who's not a fact witness out of the case. So the first thing I want you to do 
is expand your definition, expand what you think of, uh, who you think of as being experts. Because I think the best experts are not hired. The best experts in your case are the people that will give you expert testimony without you having to pay for it. Because once you start paying somebody for something, then credibility and bias comes into play. I've had cases where defense lawyers have tried to, to say that the police officer is biased that because he met with me, and, and I'll talk about this in a, in, in a little bit, but because he met with me that somehow we did something, something unsavory. You're gonna try to impugn the credibility of a police officer? I don't think that's gonna fly. The same with doctors and surgeons. You're gonna see a, a, a doctor and a surgeon today, some of his deposition testimony, Dr. Bendix, that a lot of y'all know. And defense experts, or excuse me, defense lawyers, uh, think a lot of things about certain orthopedic surgeons, certain uh, people, certain doctors who treat clients on liens. Well, I mean, if their client didn't cause, if the defendant didn't cause the injury, then my client, the plaintiff, wouldn't need the treatment. And if my client didn't need the treatment, they wouldn't need the lien. So even with that, even trying to bring bias into certain experts, I think it falls on deaf, deaf ears because those experts, those police officers, those doctors, which are the two we're going to focus on today, those people were involved in the case before lawyers were. They were doing their jobs and they're experts by virtue of doing their jobs. They're not experts. Well, being an expert isn't their job. So I'm always weary of any, any person who your job is being an expert. You know, it's that old saying, if you can't do, teach. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't particularly think it is. I think there's some phenomenal teachers out there and, and that is you know, their, their skill. But if you're an expert witness, why are you doing that? You're doing that because you, you get more money. You're doing that because it's easier. There, there's maybe a lot of factors, but the truth is you are not as credible as someone who is an expert by nature of doing their job. So I touched on this a second ago. With these experts, whether they're hired or not, you have to go meet with them. You need to learn about them. You need to get their resume or their CV. You need to find out what their qualifications and credentials are so you know that they truly are an expert. Now, a lot of times with motor vehicle crashes, you need to learn, does the police officer have specialized training in accident reconstruction? Does the police officer have specialized training in whatever the circumstances are? Report investigation taking measurements. You need to know these things. Then what, during that meeting, I think you need to help the witness explain that they are an expert. A lot of these people who are police officers and doctors are not used to standing in front of or sitting in front of a camera in a deposition or in front of the jury and saying, I'm an expert and here's why I'm an expert. Most people by nature, and I'll tell you the best witnesses by nature are modest. Are modest. So you need to really build them up and give them the confidence and say, look, I need you to talk about yourself, even if it's uncomfortable. The last thing I think you want to do in the meeting is you need to figure out if the expert has a system, if the expert has a system for doing what the expert does. I bet you I could talk to a hundred police officers and say, do you have a system for investigating a crash? Most of them would say, ah, I just, you know, I do this, 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 and this. I talked to 10 other police officers. Most of them would say, yeah, I mean, I do this, 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 and this. And, and it's the same thing. So although they don't have a lot of, although a lot of times experts don't know their system, they have one. They have one. So if an expert says to you, I don't have a system, I don't have a process by which I do something, I bet you they do. And I bet you your job then is to walk through the system with you. For example, first thing a police officer does is get the call, go to the scene, get out of the car, make sure everybody's okay. If you ask 100 police officers what the first thing that they do is, they may say the first thing I do is talk to the drivers. Well, no, respectfully, it's not. The first thing you do is you get the call, you go to the scene, you get out of your car and you make sure everybody's okay. And that is bar none across the board. So you need, after that meeting that you have with the expert, you need to leave where the expert knows they're an expert 
and then the expert is able to articulate their process or system for how they use their expertise, okay? So, I wanna walk through the basic, the basic outline of an expert deposition. The first thing you're going to do, the first thing you're going to do is have the expert introduce themselves, say who they are and what they do, and here's what I like to do. I like to ask the expert where they are if it's a video deposition. Where are we? Where's this all happening? What I wanna do is I want the jury to be able to close their eyes and imagine that we are somewhere. So that, that, that way that doctor is testifying in their practice. He, the witness can see that. The police officer is testifying at the police station. It gives importance. What also gives importance is if you're able to have the witness wear the clothing of their expertise. It's a weird way to say that, but it's the clothing of their expertise. So if a doctor wears scrubs, if a nurse wears scrubs, have the doctor wear scrubs. If the doctor wears a white jacket, a white coat, have the doctor wear that. If you can get a police officer to show up in his or her uniform, that's great. Again, that's conveying importance. And even by looking at the witness, you know that witness is an expert. You know the witness is an expert if they show up in a, in a white doctor's coat. You know that guy's a doctor. That lady's a doctor. They're an expert in something. A police officer walks in. That police officer is an expert in certain things. So you make sure you're conveying the expertise, not just in words and not just in qualifications, but also in looks, meaning the way that the expert looks and the way that the expert displays to the jury. So I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on background here, but I'm gonna show you some quick introductions for a doctor and for a police officer. So let me show you all this. All right, here's an introduction with an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, it looks like some of y'all are having trouble with sound. I apologize. Let me apologize. I apologize. Let me see what is going on here. Give me one moment. I apologize. There we go. All right. Forgive me. <laughs> Let's try this again. Would you state your name for the jury? Oh. Eric Thor Bendix. And where do you work? Georgia Spine and Orthopedics. Uh, what kind of doctor are you? I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. What exactly does that mean? Uh, an orthopedic surgeon is a medical doctor who uh, takes care of uh, medical uh, conditions of the musculoskeletal system. So that means the bones, ligaments, muscles, tendons, nerves, discs, joints of the body. Within orthopedics, there's several different subspecialty areas. Um, uh, one is pediatric, so that would be a specialist who takes care of musculoskeletal issues in kids. Another would be hip and knee replacement. So in folks who have uh, injuries or um, uh, uh, hip and knees uh, injuries or hip and knees that have worn out, those can be replaced. Placed. And then another area is spine, and that's my subspecialty area of interest. So I take care of infections, cancers, injuries of the neck, mid, and low back. Uh, Georgia Spine Orthopedics, is that your practice? Yes, it is. How many locations do you have here in Atlanta? Uh, five. And what location are we in now? Uh, we're in the Tucker office. I see your <clears throat> scrubs. What have you been doing today? Uh, seeing patients today. I want so, what you just heard was a very brief description of who this person is what their expertise is and what that actually means to the public. Uh, what is an orthopedic surgeon? What, what does that mean? Um, and then we've very quickly gotten the importance out there, the importance of the doctor that, what have you been doing today? I've been seeing patients and that's why I'm wearing this. Let's look at another example. So this is a police officer, couldn't get him to 
uh, wear his uniform. And the main reason is he's not, uh, he's not working the, a bead anymore. He's uh, in a desk job. But here's another example. Yes, sir. Officer, would you tell the jury your name? Officer Gabriel McElroy. And where are you a police officer? State of Atlanta. How long have you been a State of Atlanta police officer? About 10, 11 years. Uh, what is your rank? Officer. Right now, are you assigned to any specific division or unit? Right now, presently, I'm with the Open Records Division. Okay. At some point in time, were you uh, part of the traffic, the traffic unit? Yes. But what was that unit called? The uh, Field Operation Division. Uh, where are we right now? We are at 226 Peachtree, Atlanta, Georgia. And where, what building is this? The Atlanta headquarters. The Atlanta. police headquarters. Okay. Um, now I want to take you back to when you. So really quickly, who you are, where you are, and hopefully to the jury why that's important. So those are very brief introductions. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. So, but I think very quickly, you want to tell the jury who the heck this person is and why they're an expert. I want them knowing they're an expert right away. And remember, I don't want to just have the, the expert say, I'm an expert. I want to show it. I want to show it. Um, I want to show the badge. I want to show the crest. I want to show the, the scrubs or whatever it is. Uh, I'm going to zoom through. I'm going to zoom through the actual qualifications of these people. Um, it's not important where they went to school or any of those things. But I want to, to show you the tendering part when, I, when I'm going to offer this expert as a witness. Okay? It's, a, it's a one quick sentence you want to do after you've identified the person, walk through their credentials, um, and we'll talk about the system in a second. But for Dr. Bendex, for Dr. Bendex, um, I'll show you the tendering. And there's going to be an objection here. And I want you to focus in on making sure that the expert is tendered exactly how you want them and there, that there is no disagreement. So here's Dr. Bendex. After he's walked through his qualifications and I've used his CV, I now wanna offer him as an expert. Let me make sure y'all have sound this time. <laughs> there we go, we should be good. Uh, Plaintiff now moves uh, Dr. Bendix in as an expert in orthopedic spine surgeon. I have no objection to Dr. Bendix testifying as an expert with regard to his capacity as a treating physician in this case. I do object to him testifying as an expert witness under 91126 to anything beyond his care and treatment of his patient, Mr. Nguyen. So at that point, I don't know what the heck that means at, the, at that moment. I mean, I, I'm half listening because I'm focusing on what I'm going to ask and, and how I'm going to give the, uh, the opinions which are coming next. So. If somebody objects, I am not a, I'm not a big arguer. I, there's nothing you can do during a deposition to settle something if someone objects. I mean, the record shows it. It is what it is. But when you're taking a four-trial video deposition of an expert, you need to, typically it's your only chance to have that expert testify. So you need to make sure that you fully understand the objection. So that way you can cure it if you need to. For example, if the objection is there's not enough foundation, then you need to go back and you need to cure that problem. But if the objection is something that is more academic that you can't deal with right then, just move on. There's no point in arguing, arguing with it. But I, in this exchange, I want to make sure that I understand exactly what the objection is. Treatment of his patient, Mr. Nguyen. So we agree that Dr. Bendix is an uh, expert with the with regard to Mr. Wynn. I have no objection to Dr. Bendix testifying as an expert in the field of orthopedic surgery as it applies to his care and treatment provided to Mr. Nguyen. Anything beyond his care and treatment of Mr. Nguyen, his patient, I will object to him being offered as an expert witness. So you don't make those objections on the record if you think I go too far? I will. Okay. All right. So what I gathered from that objection was that the lawyers saying, the defense lawyers saying that Dr. Bendix is an expert pertaining to this witness. And, and not for something else, which to date, and we tried this case, I still don't understand exactly what that means. So in that case, what I did was I said to the defense lawyer, and you're gonna make your objections on the record if you think I go too far doing whatever I'm not supposed to do. And then he will throughout the entire deposition, but at least it's on the record, and at least I understand what it is, and I'm getting an objection for every question, every question that they think is improper, okay? Um, now that's with the doctor. With a doctor, uh, I think you wanna get immediately through their qualifications, immediately through them being tender as an expert, and I think what you wanna focus on as soon as you can, 
as soon as you can is getting the conclusions and the opinions out loud for the jury. So look at the, I mean, look at my screen. It, it's minute five. So I've said who Dr. Bendix is. I've said what he's an expert in. I've had him walk through his qualifications. I know y'all didn't see that, but I had him walk through his qualifications. He says, I did a residency. Well, what's a residency? I did a fellowship. What's a fellowship? Um, where do you have hospital privileges? You know, if there's a long list of privileges that every juror knows uh, in the metro Atlanta area or wherever you are, if you're able to have the jury say, oh, wow, this doctor can perform surgeries at Northside, Piedmont, uh, Grady, Emory, I mean, that again is also giving expertise. So I've gotten all the way through who the person is, what their expertise is, and that they are an expert. Now, I want my conclusions on the table immediately. Why? Because even the best expert witness, even the best expert witness is probably going to make the jury doze off for at least a second. So I want the jury to know right away what the opinions are. So here they are. And, and y'all are going to hear objections during this. It, it, the video is later cut, but just so you, I want to show y'all a real deposition of how this worked in practice. So I'm going to play it right through uh, until the opinions are done. Dr. Bendix, are you familiar with the patient of yours? Uh, Tom Wynn, he goes by Tom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, is he a patient of yours? Yes, he is. Have you treated Mr. Wynn since early 2016? Yes, I have. Did you conclude that the treatment you gave to him was the result of a car accident on April 27, 2014? Objection. This is beyond the scope of his testimony as an expert orthopedic surgeon as applies to the treating physician. Doctor, let me we'll note your objection. Let me ask you that again, okay? Sure. Uh, did you conclude that, Mr. Wynn, excuse me, did you conclude that the treatment that you provided to Mr. Wynn was the result of a car crash on April 27, 2014? Same objection, Lacks Foundation. All right, let me, let me a clean question. When I say clean question, what am I asking for? What am I doing? I know that this video is going to be cut. So a lot of my ums and a lot of this talking <laughs> is going to be, um, is going to be cut out of the video. So the, what I'm doing, uh, is I am going to stop, tell the lawyer that their objection is noted on the record, which obviously it is because there's a person sitting there writing it down, and I'm going to ask them to reserve their objection, that it applies to the next question, and then I'm going to ask my question so I get what I call a clean question and answer, a clean question and answer. So that way when I cut the video, assuming the objection is overruled, I'm able to have a clean question and answer without the defense lawyer talking during my deposition and during the testimony that the jury's later going to hear. All right, so. Dr. Bendix, did you conclude that the treatment you gave to Mr. Wynn was the result of a car crash on April 27th, 2014? Yes, I did. Was the treatment you provided to Mr. Wynn reasonable? Yes. Was it necessary? Yes. Is that also true with his medical bills that he incurred as a result of treatment? He has bills, yes, as a result of his treatment, yes. And it, is it your testimony that they were related to the car crash on April 27, 2014? Objection to you. Uh, yes, they are. Do you believe that the bills related to the car crash on April 27, 2014? Let me ask you again. I asked you pretty much the same question, but I had to do so through an objection. Okay. Do you believe that the bills Mr. Wynn incurred from your treatment was the result of the car crash on April 27, 2014? I'm going to restate my objection that I made at the outset. I want to make sure that the record is clear with respect to my objections. By the way, the record is clear because it's written down on a piece of paper. It can't be more clear than that. So this is just a lawyer who's, again, restating a speaking objection, which, by the way, is improper. But before that, before that, I asked, the, I asked Dr. Bendex if the bills were reasonable and necessary. He said yes. And I asked if they're related to the car crash. And he said, yeah, there are bills. He didn't really give an answer. So then I led him. I mean, I, I purposely, I led the witness. So that way, the witness knows what the answer I'm looking for is. Now, the answer is true. I know it's true. But the witness is not thinking in the terms that I'm thinking. So once I give that answer and I hear the leading objection, I then rephrase my question. And I, eventually, I tell the, uh, tell the doctor, I'm basically asking you the same question. And then I ask it in a proper non-leading way. And, and I've gotten this objection. But I'll let this roll on. Judge. So any of this testimony, that, any of these questions that you're asking him and the answers that he's giving are beyond the scope of what he is permitted to testify to as a treating physician expert in orthopedic surgery. The only good treating physician can give causation? Or, uh, 
you want to make sure you get your questions clear. I want to make sure that my okay. objection doesn't get left out. Okay. Uh, your objection is noted for the next question. Doctor, uh, do you believe that Mr. Wynn's uh, treatment and resulting bills would res <laughs> strike that? Now, if I could only learn to speak, this would be a lot easier. Uh, when the bills actually occurred uh, for your treatment, the result of the 8.7-2014 car injection? Yes, they were. Uh, were the medical bills that Mr. Wynn incurred from you reasonable necessary? Yes, they are. Uh, Notice I snuck that question in, even though I'd already asked it, but I snuck it in and didn't get an objection. So to me, that objection's waived. But what I've just done is I'm eight minutes in. I'd like to be about six minutes in, but I'm about eight minutes in, and I already have the jury, hopefully, knowing that this person is an expert in something and knowing what their opinions are. Now, this doctor and, and most doctors, their system is pretty easy. It's, I see the patient, I review whatever I have, studies, imaging, whatever. I treat the patient, and then I recommend a course of treatment. For a police officer, for a police officer, I think you can get a little more specific about the system that the police officer uses. So I will tell you, with respect to Officer McElroy, who is one of the nicest guys I know and the most helpful guys I know, um, and if you have an open records request, he's probably fulfilling it right now in Fulton County because that's what he does now. He, he got into this really bad uh, crash. He was actually injured and disabled on the job in the middle of this case, in the middle of my case, which you know, I knew him beforehand and I've now known him after. And, um, but anyway, he is not, with respect to him, he is not the um, strongest witness and he's not particularly great at explaining the things that he does and why he does them. He's, he's kind of short um, and he's not a great explainer. So what I did after his, or during his deposition was I had him walk through how he goes about, how he goes about uh, performing an accident or performing a, a crash investigation. And the way I did that was you already heard his introduction of how he is. I asked him about all his training. And then what I'm going to do, and I'll stop before I get here, is I'm going to recap all of that in a soundbite. We'll talk about soundbites more. But here is his background, walking into how he uses his background to investigate car crashes. So picking up right where we left off. You were in the other division. Did you investigate motor vehicle crashes? Yes, I did. Do you have any specialized knowledge that allows you to investigate motor vehicle crashes? Yes, I do. Uh, did you gain that knowledge from training and experience in yes, investigating motor vehicle crashes? Yes, I did. You know where I'm going already? Yes, I have done this before. Um, I want to ask you first, training in your for the record, he had only been deposed once before, and it was in my case. We had to depose him twice. And this deposition is a very good example, I think, of a point-by-point -point textbook textbook deposition of making sure you lay foundation because there were all these foundational objections and the judge actually initially ruled that we hadn't laid proper foundation in his deposition so this is my my second go around and i'm going to do everything to the t i mean to the letter so just fy your experience okay uh, what kind of training do you have that relates to the crash station well the atlanta uh, police academy i did that for six months when you finish the academy, you know, you go through field training. That's where you ride with a seasoned veteran police officer, and he grades you, you know, how you would do. So six months of that, um, learning, you know, doing different vehicle accidents, and then you're on your own. And from there, you know, I've probably done about, I can't even count the number of car accidents. So long process, learning. Uh, when you are, uh, when you were doing crash investigations, were your investigation reports reviewed by someone? Yes. And were you given a continued training uh, even after you were done with the academy and then the ride-along? Yes, you're always training because you keep getting car accidents. So it's a never-ending process. Uh, in terms of your experience investigating car crashes, you said you wouldn't be able to count how many. Yes. Um, I'm not asking you for a second, but in those 10, 11 years, how many crashes would you say you've investigated? Uh, roughly, probably between two and 3,000, 2,500 maybe in the middle. Uh, do you use your experience when investigating motor vehicle crashes? Yes. And do you use your training as well? Yes. Based on your specialized knowledge, training, experience, do you have a process that you use to investigate motor vehicle crashes? Yes. Can you tell the jury about that process? Um, we'll be called. As soon as I get to the call, um, I look at the vehicles. 
get out of my vehicle, look at the roadway, check if there are any um, slippery or anything like that, or anything. Um, talk to the people involved, we'll get their story, and investigate the scene, see if there's anything available. Go from there. So the first thing you do actually is to. All right. So again, with respect to Officer McElroy, not the best description of his system or process. I mean, this this doesn't scream to me that he's an expert. So what I need to do now is I need to lay it for him. And and I had spent a considerable amount of time over two depositions talking with him about his process. Um, it's not that he doesn't have one. It's just that he wasn't the best articulating it. So I'm going to help him now. And if I'm going to get leading objections, which I actually won't, but if I get them, I'm going to live with it. And then I'm going to feed him as much as I can and then ask proper questions. I'm not going to do it in any sort of what I think at least in any sort of unethical way. There's nothing wrong with asking a leading question if I need to. So I'm going to ask the questions as best I can to be fair, um, to be proper questions, but also helping him lay out the system step by step. So here we go. So the first thing you do to actually is to go to a scene? Yes. Is the second thing that you do typically to look at the physical evidence? Yes. Does that physical evidence include looking at the roadway, the damage to the vehicles, positioning the vehicles in the roadway? That's the primary I just said, then the roadways. Yes. Uh, you said you also speak to drivers? Yes. And do you consider the law? No, I'm sorry. Do you consider the law? Yes. yes. And ultimately, based on your investigation, is the last thing you do to make an, a conclusion director? Yes. Is this the process, is this process the product or result of reliable principles and methods? Yes. Uh, plaintiff offers. All right. So. What I've done there is I've asked the officer what his process is, even after working with him, and I didn't really like the answer. So what I did was I laid out the process step by step. So if I hear you right, is the first thing that you do to go to the scene? Yeah. Next, do you check on the driver? Sure. But then do you look at the roadway and evaluate whatever you can see? Sure. Do you speak to the drivers? Yes. I then asked, do you, do you consider the law? Do you consider the law? The reason I'm doing that is because, as most of us know, there's very limited times that a citation can be used in Georgia. So the officer in this case wrote a citation to the defendant, but he's not allowed to say it. But I at least want to give a nod, want to give a nod that the officer knows the law and that he tries to follow it and tries to assess it based on what the law is, because we'll talk about contributing factors later. And then the last question I have for the officer in that scenario is, is you just told us about this process. Is that the process or system that you used in this case? So not only does he have a process and system, does he now use it in this case? And he says, yes, of course I used it in this case. Anything else would be ridiculous. So what you've done is you've set up an expert as being an expert. You've told, about, you've told the jury about how they go about being an expert, what their system or process is. And then you've said that the expert uses it, or used it in the crash that you are investigating or whatever the situation is. I'm then going to tender the expert and tender him as an expert in this case uh, in police investigation. Uh, Patrick asked, where do I get the information on what the police officer specialized training is? Uh, there's two ways generally to do that. I think the easiest way and what you should, probably should do almost in every case is find the officer and ask them, you know, ask well, how long you've been officer for? How many crashes did you investigate? What was your training? You know, this officer couldn't really remember most of his training. So I wasn't gonna go step by step through, you know, what you learned and when you learned it and what classes they were and what levels. Um, there are other officers though. Chris Stokes took a deposition that I watched actually preparing for this one, deciding if I was gonna use it, uh, where he had a really, uh, a police officer who was a really good historian of his education. So he was able to say, I went through this training, this training, level one, level two, level three, this is what they were about, this is when I did them, um, I didn't have that with this witness. And no matter what I did, this witness wasn't going to, to, to change uh, into, you know, into that. The second option, by the way, is you can request uh, a police officer's personnel file. And a lot of times you will get training, you will get disciplinary issues, you will get whatever's publicly available. And you can do that through an open records request in person, at least in the city of Atlanta, or through the mail. Um, so those are all options. So we now have this expert and we've had the expert qualified um, in, the case of, uh, in the case of a doctor, in the doctor example, we've had the experts say their qualifications and then immediately, immediately give their opinions in the case. Then you wanna go through, we'll go with the, down the doctor road right now. 
you want to have the doctor explain his or her treatment of the plaintiff. When did they see each other? What tests were done? What, what did they see? And you want as best you can to have the doctors, um, have the doctors, I'm trying to think of the best word here. You want to try your best to have the doctor's treatment and assessment of the patient be shown to the jury. You want the jury to see what the doctor saw. So one way to do that, and, and if you haven't watched uh, my damages webinars, there's two of them, part one and part two. You can go back to the YouTube channel and you can watch those. I talked about medical illustrations, and I'm going to show you one that's actually in practice here. And I'll tell you something I wish I would have done a little differently and something that I thought we did pretty well. So right here, what you're going to see is you're going to see a board, a board of some imaging. So there is the preoperative lumbar spine, two images from an MRI. What I wish I would have done differently during this expert deposition is I wish I would have done this electronically. I had boards. So when I say a board, what you're looking at is a poster board, like a high school poster board. And what we've done is we've printed off the images. Obviously, the images look terrible. They look terrible. They look fine in person, but they look terrible on video. I remember when I looked back at the video, I said, Ugh, that doesn't look too good. So I wish I would have done this through video or through an electronic system where you can have the court reporter do that. Uh, the court reporting company that I use um, is Pope Reporting. And Pope Reporting will provide videos um, or videographer. And they'll also provide the technology that you need in order to put this uh, on a computer screen. And then the doctor would be able to use a pen or a mouse and highlight things and, and you know, pretend they're on ESPN showing at the big board, you know, moving stuff around and all that. So I didn't do that here. But what, I'm going to mute this and talk while it shows. There we go. What, the reason I like using the boards is because I can have the camera person zoom in, which is what you're seeing right now. And I can have the doctor show exactly what he or she wants to show the jury and, and go through what the doctor did when evaluating studies. And you can see how bad that looks. Thankfully, though, thank that the video wouldn't be great. We came with colorized copies, colorized imaging. So there you go. So these are those same images, but they're colorized. Now, of course, at trial, I can use electronic copies of the original images, but these colorized ones are great. And they will allow the doctor to show exactly where the problem is. I mean, again, imagine you're not a doctor. You stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. If you're looking right between L5 and S1, where it says bulging disc L5, S1, I mean, on the right, you can see the bulge. I'm only using images when I can see the bulge. Because if I show an image and the jury goes, I don't know what I'm looking at, it's pointless. I can actually see, I mean, anybody can look at that and say, wow, one thing isn't like the others. One thing isn't like the others. And you can see it on both images. And I'll give you a little taste for what I'm asking a doctor to do here. What we've done is we've done an illustration. And my question to you first before we talk about this is, does that illustration accurately show uh, what's going on and what's happening with the lumbar spine image? Uh, yes, it does. Is it a fair and accurate illustration? Yes, it is. And would it help you to explain to the jury what they're seeing here? It would. Uh, plaintiff moves plaintiff's exhibit two and three in evidence. Um, I have no objection to them coming part of the record, but these are not going to, I object to them going back with the jury. Okay. Dr. Bendis, can you explain that you're using illustration what we're seeing here? It might be easier. Uh, right. So these are uh, cartoon illustrations of what we're seeing in MRI here. Here we have. Uh, I don't love the word cartoon, by the way. I don't love the word cartoon. I prefer medical illustration. But you can't control what the witness says all the time. Darker blue fluid that is around the nerves within the spinal canal. Here are the bones. They're in a uh, uh, tan color. And then between them is the pink discs right here with a hard wall on the front and on the back of the disc and the soft jelly in the center. Here, the wall in the front and the back wall has been thinned a little bit because there is some bulging, a little bit of damage to that back wall. Uh, and then here at this bottom disc, the L5S1, we can see that the back wall has been further damaged and there's more material pushing out the back. So what I am doing during this deposition Literally, at this moment in the deposition, I have gotten up from my seat, I've, I've kept my mic on, but I've actually walked behind the camera person, and I am telling the camera person, zoom in, do this, do that. I am like a director, because this is what the jury is going to see. The jury is going to see my movie, and this is a mini movie that they're going to see. So 
I think you need to be very active about how the movie is shown. So you need to tell your camera person, here's what I need you to do, here's what I want you to do, if you're gonna do it this way at least. And you need to have them on board. You need to be telling them, I need you to zoom, I need you to move left, right, I need you to pan out, whatever it is. Um, so I am, that's what I'm doing in the background, looking like a crazy person. Um, but I wanna get the shot right, because the, the, the illustration matters. All right, so that's one way that you can use illustrations in a deposition. Um, and you heard, you heard me say, does, would this help you explain your testimony to the jury? And the doctor said, yes. That, I believe at least, is the key standard for Dauber. You know, we've already proved this, this person's an expert and their testimony has to help, has to help the jury um, understand some issues. So that's the question you wanna ask. And I'm always trying to move as much as I can into evidence. Whether they go into evidence or not, doesn't really matter to me as long as the jury's seeing it. Um, but I'm at least giving it the college try. I don't think these go back in evidence and they didn't in our case. So um, let's go to the police officer now. Let's go to the police officer's key findings because you're literally seeing the key findings in, or at least you just saw the key findings in Dr. Bendix's testimony. It was the bulge. And he's later gonna talk about the surgery that he did. But let's look at Officer McElroy, McElroy, geez, for five years, I still can't say this guy's name. And I apologize every time to him. What I'll tell you is in the, in the case involving him, it was a motor vehicle crash. One of the key questions, one of the key questions that needed to be answered was who, what lane was this hotel shuttle bus in? And what lane was my client in? What our story was, was that our client was in the far left lane and the hotel shuttle bus was in the second to left lane. And as they're driving down the road, they approach uh, a left turn. You can either go straight or make a left turn. My client goes to make the left turn from the left lane and the hotel shuttle bus tries to make a left turn from the second to left lane, which was improper. So with expert testimony of a police officer, at least, you generally, generally cannot have the jury or have the police officer tell the jury who's wrong, who's right, and who caused the accident, who caused the accident. So what I'm doing is I'm doing everything I can to get as close to that line as possible. And one way to do that, one way to do that is by asking hypotheticals. You are allowed to ask hypothetical questions of if A happened, is that breaking the law? Is that improper? If B happened, is that breaking the law? Is that improper? If C happened, so what you're doing is you're not telling the jury what happened. You're not answering the ultimate question from them, although with expert testimony, sometimes you can ask and have the ultimate question answered. But what you're doing is you're giving the jury the three options. So this one's correct, this one's correct, this one's not. And then you gotta prove to them that the thing that happened was the run that wasn't okay. So here I'm gonna set up with the witness what his opinion was about what lanes everyone was in, and then I'm gonna ask him my hypothetical questions. Two. Did you also get driver number two, Mr. Wynn? Yes, I did. And what did he tell you? Mr. Wynn said that he was driving straight in his lane before I left when all of a sudden driver one turned in front of him. Right, let me make sure this is crystal clear. What lane did you determine that Mr. Bernard in the hotel shuttle bus was in? Uh, the shuttle bus was in the uh, far right lane, uh, closer to the, um, far from the left lane. Was it the far left lane or the second to left lane? The uh, second to left lane. Would that, and maybe the diagram would help here on the next page. Was Mr. Bernard in the middle lane? Yes, middle lane. And then Mr. Wynn and Nissan Altima, what lane was he in? He was in the far left lane. All right, so no matter how much you try, you can't always control everything. Here, I know the facts better than the police officer does. So when the police officer gets it wrong at first, I need to direct him back to his report, which he wrote and which I'm relying on, and get him on the same page as me. So now I've got everybody locked in the lanes that I want them to be in, and, and that is the truth. So I want him to get to the truth, and I helped him get there. Uh, I mentioned di the diagram. Based on your investigation, did you create a diagram? Yes, sir. Is the diagram the result of work? Uh, investigation of the physical evidence as well as being the drop test? And does your diagram accurately show how you believe the crash happened? Yes, it does. I want to ask you a, a few hypothetical questions. If Mr. Bernard in the MTI shuttle bus made a left turn from the second to left lane, mm -hmm. would that have been a proper left turn? No. If Mr. Wynn in the Nissan Altima, oh, see if we can get the bus, made a left turn from the second left lane, mm -hmm. would that have been a proper left turn? No. If Mr. Wynn in the Nissan Altima, 
Oklahoma was proceeding straight, mm -hmm. would that have been proper? Yes. If Mr. Wynn was proceeding straight and then was going to make a left turn in the intersection when he got there, mm -hmm. would that have been proper? Yes. Did you All right. So what I've just done here. So what I've just done here is I've identified the key piece of evidence and had the expert testify as to what that is. And that is that they were, the two vehicles were next to each other, Nissan Altima on the left, shuttle bus in the middle lane. And then I've given him three scenarios, because there are only three scenarios. If the shuttle bus turned left into the car, is, would that have been wrong? If, and that's the key word, hypotheticals are allowed. If, and the expert said, no, you can't do that. And then I turned to my client. If my client was just going straight, which he was allowed to do, is that okay? Totally okay. If he was making, if he was going straight and then he was gonna make a left in the intersection and then he got hit, would that have been okay? Totally okay. So now my job as a lawyer throughout the rest of the case and through closing arguments is to make sure that the jury agrees with me and agrees with the police officer that one, it's improper to make a left turn from that lane, which should be settled. But more importantly, that the hotel shuttle bus did actually make that turn because that was the contention in the case. Now I'm gonna talk about contributing factors with the officer. And maybe you'll think this is as funny as I can, but based on an order from the judge after the officer's first deposition, there were certain words that were not allowed to be used. And throughout this deposition up until this point, uh, the officer would use a word that he wasn't allowed to. And we've, we tried our best to explain to him, you know, these are words you can't use. So when I ask him what a contributing factor is, in his defense, he is so limited by what he can say that I don't really think that the definition of a contributing factor comes through very well. I, I really don't. Um, so give him a pass on that. But you'll see, I think, a little bit of levity here. And then I'll ask him why the contributing factors, what they mean and why they're important. And again, the contributing factors are what I think, at least, is the most important thing in a police officer's report. Because using words I wasn't allowed to use in this case, it is what caused, what contributed to causing the crash. So here's the officer. So he knows it. He knows he's not allowed to say that. <laughs> oh, I might not have shared that with you all. Hold on. My fault. <laughs> I'm playing it to myself. Told you this was the most technologically challenging one I've ever done. <laughs> All right, here we go. Take, and then he was gonna make a left from the intersection when he got there. Would that have been problem? Yes. Could you assign either driver a contributing factor? Yes. What is a contributing factor? A contributing factor is the cause of the accident. Oh, good. There's a Mia. We'll strike that answer. Remember our rules. You can't say cause, you can't say whatever else. If you hit something else, we'll tell you. Okay. I'm just gonna object to the cause of this so it's on the record. Okay. We won't use that question and answer. Maybe it's over, I think. I agree. Uh, officer, what is a contributing factor? A contributing factor. I don't know the words to use now. Watch it. A contributing factor could be. Eyes is my favorite. What things that allowed the accident to happen? Okay. Uh, did you assign a contributing factor in this case? Yes, I did. Uh, did you? Who did you assign a contributing factor to? Uh, driver one, Mr. Bernard. That's the hotel shuttle bus driver. Yes, it is. Uh, what number did you assign a number as a contributing factor? I pick twenty-six, and that means other, which you know can mean anything. Like the other, it can mean anything. Well, in this crash, mm -hmm. what did twenty-six signify? Proper left turn. What was the basis, or excuse me, was the basis for your opinion to assign a contributing factor for an improper turn to Mr. Bernard? Was it your entire investigation? Yes. Uh, did you assign a contributing factor to Mr. Wynn? No. All right, so I've gotten the most important testimony that I need. I've gotten what lane everybody was in, and I got that, uh, what the contributing factors are. The very last topic that I want to talk to you all about is uh, how you deal with bias and how you deal with um, with communications that you've had with an expert prior to the deposition. Because in almost every deposition, you're going to hear the defense lawyer or the lawyer on the other side ask, did you meet with Mr. Rafi? Did you talk to him? Did you text with him? And my approach to this is to be completely honest and upfront. Bring it up yourself and take away the aura or the stigma that there's something wrong with it. 
that there's something wrong with it. So uh, I'm going to play the officer because as you can imagine, this is a second deposition. I've talked to him literally over years. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to wait for the defense to somehow make my, my communication with the officer to make this deposition simple and easy and convenient for him. And also to learn what he was going to say. I'm not going to sit back and let them make that look unsavory. I'm going to bring it up and show not is it, that it's not unsavory, that I'm doing my job, I'm a good lawyer, and that the officer was helping us get to the bottom of the truth. So here you go. I'll remember to share my screen this time so you all can see it. Well, you remember this crash? Um, it was back in 2014? Yes. Since then, have you talked to a bunch of lawyers about yeah. this crash? Yes, I have. Um, have you and I talked on the phone? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> have we talked in person? Yes, we have. Uh, have we sent each other text messages? Yes, we have. Fair to say, you and I have talked over the years a, a good amount of time about this crash. Yes, we have. Uh, have you talked to um, the lawyers who represent the bus company? Yes. Uh, did they come down to the CNN Center and talk to you? Yes, they did. Uh, I think it was a lawyer and then a, a young lady yes. or that? Yes, Did all the lawyers in here already have what's called a deposition, what we're doing right now? Yes. And did you answer all the questions at that time? Yes. And you spent a lot of time dealing with this crash since you wrote this bus report? Yes. And the lawyers for the bus company, did the state and ask to sign? Yes, they did. Cross some stuff out and ask to sign. Did you fully understand what state was going to do? I don't ask you, but over the years, with all these lawyers asking you questions, um, maybe the most important question after this for you is this. Is there anything that the lawyers have done or could do to change your testimony in any way? No. Are you absolutely confident that the driver of the MTI shuttle bus made an improper left? So, I just let the cat out of the bag, if that's what you want to call it. I went ahead and said, because I knew the defense was going to do this, I explained all the communication that everybody has had over the years with, with this police officer. There's nothing wrong with that. And then I followed it up by asking the officer, is there anything, anything that I could have done, the other lawyer could have done, that anybody in this world could have done to make you change your mind about the opinions? And his answer is no. So I think you can alleviate that, that problem if it even is that, but you can take away the stigma right off the bat with the doctors. Uh, I mean, I'm showing Dr. Bendix, as you all saw the illustrations. So at some point in the deposition, I say to him, doctor, I met with you beforehand, right? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. No, I needed to show you these illustrations so you knew how to convey what happened to the jury. He goes, yeah, I wouldn't have done the deposition if I didn't see this stuff. So doing that really takes the wind out of the sails. If the other side has not, if the other side has not spoken with the witness before, you can still do it. And also you can make them look kind of dumb. You say to the witness, doctor, police officer, whoever, expert, expert, I met with you, right? Yeah. How did that happen? Well, Mike, you called me up and you asked if you could come to my office. I couldn't really figure out a reason to say no, so I let you come to my office and we talked. Did I try to convince you to, to say anything in particular? No. Did I ask you to tell the truth? Yeah. Did I tell you what I was going to ask you though? Oh, absolutely. If I didn't tell you that, would you be more nervous during this deposition? Would you be, uh, would you be a little more scared? Oh yeah, I would be. I'm glad I know all the questions. Now, did you meet with the defense lawyers? No, I didn't. Why not? I don't know. They never asked me. Here's the question. Here's the question. Expert, if the defense lawyers would have called you up like I did, if they would have showed up at shift change officer, if they would have done whatever, would you have met with them? Well, yes, absolutely. Why not? Now, treating doctors, it's a little trickier because of HIPAA violations and things like that. But, but the defense can still ask. The defense can still ask to meet with a doctor and then it becomes down to your client. And you can certainly, I'm trying to think how to say this. You can certainly insinuate that your client would have agreed to allow his doctor to meet with the defense lawyers, but they don't know because they didn't ask. That's a them problem, not a you problem. So. I think you can take the wind out of the sails of the bias or the credibility issue right away. Um, what I want to tell you, uh, my last little thought here, is that expert depositions, maybe more so than anything else that you're going to do live, whether it's in a deposition format or whether it's at trial, depositions of experts, depositions of experts in your directs can really, really, really be planned and prepared for. So that way you can take a lot of the unknown out. 
Um, you have the ability to meet with these folks. You have the ability to look at the law and compare what you need to do with what you're allowed to do and how you're going to do it. For example, the hypothetical questions I talked to you about, I had looked up cases and knew what I could do, or what I couldn't. I was actually reading those questions very few times. It's very rare that I do that, but I wanted to get them right. So I was actually reading the questions word for word. Um, and you can have in an expert deposition that you're taking, you can have it planned out from the start and you can do it point by point by point. So that way you can take a lot of unknowns and a lot of fear out for you as a lawyer. So even if you aren't really the expert, even if you just stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, you can come off to the jury and to the expert as knowing what's going on. But the only way to do that is to truly dive in and know the information. I heard this a long time ago and it's always rung true with me. And it's something that uh, I repeat all the time and I'll share with you. The most prepared people, the most prepared people are able to do the most ad lib things, are able to go off script the most. Because if you imagine that your script, your questions, your outline, I call them bullets, whatever you call it, the, the questions you're gonna ask the witness. If you know those questions and you know whatever the topic is, and you know the facts even better than the police officer sometimes, like I showed you, you're able to go down your road and if you have to take detours, you're able to do that. But because you're the smartest, um, big picture, most educated, big picture, and you know the facts the most, if you go down a detour, you're able to come back to it. So a lot of people think, for example, that I do things off the top of my head, um, that I'm just up there kind of, you know, spitballing it. It may look that way, and I'm glad because then it looks natural. In reality, though, I have practiced whatever I'm doing a hundred more, a hundred or more times. I've said it a billion times in my head. Um, I know Lauren Lutton and Alex Smith have heard me say this. I will say my direct and imagine, I mean, I just kind of did it in front of you. I imagine what the witness is going to say back. So I'm speaking to myself. I'll turn like a crazy person. Um, I've done that in my head hundreds of times before a deposition, especially one that's going to be for trial. And as a result, I can go down the roads that I don't expect because I know I can get back because I know my way. So my last word of advice is for expert depositions, you have to do your best to stay as many nights at the Holiday Inn Express as you can and get as educated on the topic, as educated um, on the expert and the facts of your case as you possibly can. All right? Expert depositions, taking them can be conquered. This is a conquerable skill or task. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send y'all out an outline of what I typically use uh, for expert depositions. So it's a basic formulaic outline. It is not the same in every case, but it's going to walk you through. Here's where I introduce. Here's where I do the qualifications. I tender the expert. I say my opinions up front. I go through whatever system or process that the expert told me. And then at the end, I reiterate, I reiterate my questions. So the last thing I want to show you is what the jury, what the last thing the jury heard from my direct examination of the police officer. Okay, here it is. Yes. Do uh, you have any doubt in your mind that the bus driver made an improper left turn? Yes, the bus driver made an improper left turn. Any doubt? No. No, no further questions. Thank you. At that point, at that point, the officer said he made an improper left turn. Is there any doubt in your mind? No, there's no doubt. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm going, yes, staying cool, acting cool. But I mean, that is what I want. That is what I want. I want the jury to end again on the best opinion, the best fact I have. Even watching that right now gets me excited because I'm sitting there going, yeah, that was a good ending. So I encourage you to prepare as much as you can and also consider the optics of the testimony. What you're leaving the jury with, um, it's the rule of primacy and recency. You know, the, the jury typically remembers what they hear first. That's why I want the opinions first. And they hear what, or they remember what they hear last. And I want the opinions at the end too, my very best opinion. So in terms of motivation, y'all, seriously, you can conquer, you can, you can make taking expert depositions far more manageable because you're in control, because you can get all the information, you can learn the information, uh, you can learn the expertise as best as you can, and you can pre prepare either with the witness or separately or maybe both. Um, if you do that and if you incorporate some of these things, I think, 
I think. You'll feel more confident walking into the expert deposition. Um, you'll look forward to them. I have friends who hate taking the expert depositions. And also, you're going to improve the value of your case because your message is going to be more, uh, come over more clearly. You do need to start preparing well in advance. You know, those illustrations I used for Dr. Bendix, they didn't just appear the day before. So you need to really, really decide, uh, am I ready to take this deposition? Is everything truly, truly ready? And if you do those things, I think you'll benefit a lot.